What are you ready? Okay. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation, the opportunity to speak at this uh, very nice workshop. It's my first time in South Africa. I've really had a lot of fun. I think everybody has. So today I'm going to tell you about some work that appeared uh, about a, month, a little more than a month ago in this reprint. Um, it's on something called non-isometric quantum error correction. If you don't know what you know, this phrase means, don't worry, I'll try to explain it. Uh, but the important point about this work is that there's a model of this particular quantum information theoretic object directly in gravity. Okay. So, as probably all of you know, the holographic approach to quantum gravity implies that there are two descriptions of gravitational physics. There's a semi-classical description, which involves a curved space-time with dynamical gravity and propagating quantum and this description is only a constant. There is also a microscopic description, or a boundary description, which consists of a lower dimensional quantum theory without gravity. And this description is exact and constitutes, in some cases, a non perturbative definition of quantum gravity. Now, the existence of two descriptions of the same physics, one of which is missing a few microscopic details, is a familiar situation. We have tools like the renormalization group to make such ideas precise in quantum field theory. What's unfamiliar in gravity is the existence of black holes. Black holes in the semi-classical description give rise to apparent inconsistencies which do not arise in standard situations without gravity. Two related examples that probably everyone is familiar with of such inconsistencies are the information paradox and the firewall paradox. I'm sort of being difficult, but I do take exception to the parallel of holography with the organization group. The organization group, by definition, we're taking a full theory that's defined, and then we dilute and get rid of some stuff, while holography is supposed to be an actual map between two different sides. That's right. So the, the question of the definition of the bulk side is what I'm you know, referring to. So the, the bulk side of that equality is questionable, right? Whether it has an actual definition. Uh, well, I don't know. I thought string theory AES5, for example, was a perfectly good thing, and that, uh, but yes, for in sure practice, we often then yeah. go to low energy and say well, that must be enough, and so on. Perturbatively, the theory can be defined. I it was evidently a devastating objection I came with. The only point that I'm yeah, making here is that there's a non -perturbative. Look, I'm sorry about being such a pain in the ass so early. I, I, <laughs> it's, it's, a good, it's a good time. It's a good time. <laughs> you didn't uh, engineer this you know, to happen, did you? Um, the the yeah. issue comes back. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 But I think you have to restart the projector. to restart the uh, projector. Uh, Just hit the power button. On this? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Is it true? Yeah. Check if the projector on the front yeah, just starts lighting up. I thought the projector was the white. I no, the screen see, is the white. I don't see a light on. Oh, the green. Yeah. <laughs> so you need to have a different green light. Oh, Yeah, now okay, now we're 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
from quantum information theory have been helpful in sharpening the apparent disconnect between these two descriptions, the semi-classical description and the microscopic one. In particular, quantum error correction serves as a link between the two descriptions. And the basic idea is that there is a linear map that I'll call B, which embeds a subspace, H little b, of the semi-classical Hilbert space into H big b, the microscopic Hilbert space. I'll denote it like this. This B is sometimes referred to as the holographic dictionary. So when you say some classical Hilbert space, you mean about a particular background? Yeah, for example. And here you just keep it unspecified for now? Yeah. We'll, we'll have a very explicit model later, but yeah. for now it's unspecified. <laughs> the error correction properties of the map B come from the fact that H little b is encoded redundantly in H big B. What that means is that erasing part of H big B leaves behind a remainder, which can still be enough to reconstruct, or I'll say more than this comparatively, some part of H little B. Uh, to ensure the consistency and functionality of this encoding structure, it's necessary to impose some restrictions on H little B as a subspace. A common choice of subspace, which I think was actually first made precise by Superman Kyriakos, consists of a small energy band of local semi-classical excitations around a particular background geometry. This usually ensures that there are enough states in H big B to encode all of H little b in a useful manner. But in some situations with black holes, choosing a small energy band will not even ensure the most basic requirement of standard error correction. I'll explain why this is a basic requirement shortly. Uh, the most basic requirement is that the dimension of H little b should be less than, or equal to, actually works as well, than H big b. In fact, in the information paradox, one explicitly encounters such situations where semi-classical physics in the black hole interior is expected to be valid for a very large number of states. H little b is much greater than H big b compared to the black hole entropy. But in general, it's not possible to faithfully encode a large Hilbert space into a small one. The goal of this talk is to explain, in a toy model of black hole evaporation, how gravity gets around this issue and manages to encode semi-classical states from a large Hilbert space into a smaller microscopic space. The semi-classical states in question are effective field theory excitations in the interior, while the microscopic states are the black hole microstates. Any questions about the goal? Yeah. It should be capital B, I can think of it, CFT Hilbert space? Yes. But it means CFT Hilbert space cannot be smaller than the semi-classical. We'll work in a microcanonical ensemble in this talk. So H capital B will be a small energy band of the CFT Hilbert space. And that should have a finite number of states. No, but on, end. on both sides. That's on, end. on both sides, if you take the same energy band, mm -hmm. then why would it be that the capital B I'll show an explicit model. It's this <coughs> uh, West Coast model of evaporation, where in a small energy band, the bulk Hilbert space can have an arbitrarily large number of states. Mm. But uh, is there a way to get some intuition from n equals 4? From n equals 4? Well, the, the intuition for this situation with the black hole interior is that in an evaporating black hole, the interior is in some sense growing, like the growth of the wormhole in the two sided. So that growing volume supports a very large number of states, much more than would be predicted by the black hole entropy. So in, in n equals four, that's true on the ADS5 side. Um, in, in this model, it's, it's also true in, in a particular sense, but that's, that's the intuition you should have. Maybe you mean that H B appears to be larger than B because the inner product is connected, the actual dimension of B. That's what it means. That's right. 
it, it just appears that all these independent. Well, let's let's do a little different. So in, in the semi-classical description, huh? back 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 in, in the semi-classical description, <coughs> these states really are orthogonal. In the semi-classical description, are accurate enough to say whether they are orthogonal. Good. So in we'll, we'll come to these. Yeah. This what I'm saying here is a non-perturbative. It comes from corrections to the inner product, as you know. <clears throat> okay. So here's the plan for what we're going to do. First, I'll review some facts about isometric error correction. This is, in some sense, the standard situation. Then I'll pass to a proposal for non-isometric error correction, which has been made recently. Uh, this, I want to emphasize, <coughs> is very non-standard from a quantum information theory standpoint. Uh, as far as I know, there are no definitions of non-isometric error correction from the quantum information literature. The first proposal was made by people who were interested in gravity. Uh, then we'll talk about the particular model, uh, which some of you are familiar with. Uh, it's called the West Coast model, or the PSSY model of the left hole interior. It turns out that this model supports uh, particularly explicit holographic dictionary, uh, which you can derive from Euclidean path integrals. Uh, and then finally, we'll discuss some properties of the non-isometric code that appears in this model. Okay. So standard quantum error correction begins with an isometry L between a code Hilbert space H code and a physical Hilbert space H bit. We'll distinguish these from V, H little V, and H big V, which we'll only use in the gravity context. So we have this map L, and in particular there's an isometry condition, which says that L dagger L should be equal to the identity on the code space. Now, the isometry condition implies what I said before was the most basic fact about standard quantum error correction, which is that the code space has to be smaller or equal to the dimension compared with the physical code space, essentially by count. If the code subspace were greater in dimension than the physical code space, there must exist a non-zero vector outcome in the code space, which is annihilated by the encoding map up. And that makes the isometry condition impossible to satisfy, because this operator is not supposed to have any zero modes. Now the sense in which L corrects errors is then that L allows what I'll call simulation of unitary operators W acting on each code on the encoded state in the physical code space. So this equation captures that statement. If you have some unitary operator W, a state in the code space, you can act with the dictionary to produce an encoded state. But given this vector, there should be an operator W tilde, which acts on the physical Hilbert space, which reproduces the action of W on this encoded state. So you know, on this side, we first act with W and then we encode. And in this vector, we first encode the state side, and then there should exist this W tilde. And this should exist up to a small error parameter epsilon. Now this is trivially satisfied with zero error by what's called a global reconstruction, where we simply take W tilde to be given by this formula, LWL. So if you plug this formula for W tilde into this expression, you'll find zero, making crucial use of the isometry condition for L. Now the non-trivial error correction properties of L are related to the case when W tilde can be defined using only a subspace of H physical. If we're able to satisfy this simulation condition, even when W tilde acts only on a subspace of H bits, we can erase the rest of H bits and still simulate W. That's the sense in which this criterion, when W tilde is restricted to a subspace, is a notion of error correction. We can lose some few bits and still simulate the action of W. So you mean subspace or factor? Uh, factor. Yeah. Now, when L is far from an isometry, it's not clear what to expect from a theory of error correction. Because even the global reconstruction is actually guaranteed to fail on certain states. And we have actually already encountered such states. Trying the global reconstruction, which we wrote before, in the error correction criterion, yields an error proportional to this quantity. Now, if L was an isometry, this would be 1, and this overall error would be 0. But as we saw before, when the code space is greater than the physical space dimension, there must be a state, alpha in each code, which is annihilated by the encoded map. And considering alpha in this criterion gives a large error, an order 1 error. So 
Let's, any, before I go on, any questions about standard isometric error correction? Yes. So in the non-isometric case also, you will talk about uh, errors or only this global reconstruction? Oh, we'll talk about errors as well. Okay. It depends how, how far I get, but yeah. it, it turns out that already the global reconstruction is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other questions? Okay. Okay. So a proposal for non-isometric error correction has been developed recently. First, some very initial steps were taken in this work uh, by Akers and Pennington, and then there was a longer work that appeared this summer uh, by these authors. Now, the main ingredients are a discrete set S of states in the code space and a notion of approximate state-specific reconstruction, which should be possible for states in X and operators W which preserve S. So this is the, the definition of what we mean by non-isometric error. So we again have a formula similar to the last one, but there are some differences. First, this psi and w psi need to live in the discrete set of states S. So this is not a subspace of the Hilbert space, it is just some discrete set. Now the other difference in this formula is this w tilde. So w tilde is now allowed to depend on psi. So the reconstruction can depend on the state psi, and it's not trivial that this exists. So one asks for error correction only on this discrete set, S, in the code space, and for operators with preserve. In this way, non-asymmetric codes do not faithfully encode the entire space H code, but only a discrete subset thereof. So how should I think of this S in the ADS? I guess you're going to tell I, me. I won't say anything about that, actually. Oh. I'm, I'm going to, well, I might say a little bit at the end, but the models that, for example, were considered in this paper uh, and uh, in my paper are not refined enough to give a characterization of this S beyond some very coarse grained properties, like its size. But just intuitively, what am I... The, the, I can tell you what the hope is. Yeah. The hope, so Omkar is jumping far ahead, so if you don't understand these next comments, don't worry. The hope is that this S is characterized by some sort of complexity theoretic criteria. Mm -hmm. That S is hoped to be the set of states which have bounded complexity, sub-exponential in the black hole entropy. Uh, and this is supposed to protect against bulk observers from ever telling that there's this sort of non-linearity. So S is some set of bulk states, right? Yes. S is so a it's set of low bulk complexity states. in the bulk? It's low complexity in the bulk. Okay. Not so low complexity, actually. It can be sub-exponential in the bulk. <clears throat> yeah. Does S span H code? Does S span H code? Uh, I believe it can be taken to span. But again, this is a discrete set, so you're not necessarily allowed to superimpose. Yeah. No, but just uh, it better span, right? Because otherwise, or at least it's it, the it's dimension right. of the span be better be bigger than the the edge phase dimension of H. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's right. Otherwise, the otherwise isometric the, nature would be. That's right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you, so they're discrete. You're saying you cannot make superpositions. You. It depends on the set S. So it may be that for some states in mm -hmm. the set S. You can superimpose them, and the result will be another state, Ness. But it may not be true for arbitrary superpositions. Good. So S is not a vector space. S is not a vector space. S is a set. From this perspective, we don't necessarily need to assume that all the elements in S have a good gravitational description. We, uh, we don't. But the, the idea is but that in practice, the idea is what? that the set S characterizes the set of states for which semi-classical physics holds. That, that, that's, that's my that's, understanding. That's but, but if you would apply this description <laughs> in the boundary theory or in, in this quantum mechanics, you, you, you could in principle not take well, that into account. In the boundary theory, there is only quantum mechanics. There is yeah, no there's yeah. no modification of anything. Yeah, yeah, but precisely, but, 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 but the complexity considerations could be asked at that level. They, they could be asked at that level. You, you then it's, talking about yeah, exactly. properties this, or anything. These are right. just complexity properties of yeah, some this, states which may be very complicated and not. That's right, but it's, but it's bulk complexity. So here, okay. I, I won't, it's good that we have this discussion now because I won't say anything about complexity for the rest of the talk. But <laughs> the, the notion that S is complexity protected is a bulk notion of complexity. Okay. So from the boundary, it's a little bit different. So, so everything is bulk from, from exactly. this perspective. Exactly. Thank you. So I have a couple of things. Uh, one yeah. of them is that uh, you said S is not a vector space. This I didn't understand. You can, yeah. Uh, why is it S like, I mean, S is a discrete set, because which does not necessarily respect superposition. 
So if I add two, two vectors in S, I may get something in S, but I may not. In the bulk, I'm just thinking of like some states which have nice semi class in the yep. And I'm not thinking of e to the s states. I'm thinking of states which have a dimension which is much smaller than e to the s. Then if I simply move on any other states which have a nice semi class in the That's right, but this much smaller is what we will start to push the limits of in this talk. So this set s can be quite big. I see, you're going to make it as big as this time, as big as the, the size of the full visible. I'll, I'll tell you quite how big it can be. I see. Yeah. The second question I have is about complexity. I guess yeah. you mean, you don't really mean complexity projected, but more than all states are within some range of complexity of one another. Is that what you mean? Uh, yes. The, the expectation is that relative to some particular state in, in the bulk, these are low complexity states. Yeah, uh, I mean, so this is, uh, I mean, one problem with this issue of complexity only is that. Uh, if you look at thermal field double states, look at time shift at thermal field double states, those have the exact same bulk geometry, so the complexity can be arbitrary. Ah, uh, well, okay, let's yeah, let, let's let's be a little bit careful. So if you're talking about time evolution on the boundary that moves both boundaries forward, that's a different state. And those states have different complexity. Yeah, but they have exactly the same bulk geometry. The school the schools and they they look exactly the same in the bulk. I mean that's why complexity is not such a I mean that's not why why do you say they, they look exactly so if it depends how I slice the state. Yeah. So if, if I slice the bulk geometry you know, by these nice slices, mm -hmm. then I go into the interior. It's a small black hole in the bulk. You have an of low That's right, but the wormhole here. behind the horizon is long in the future. Yeah. The wormhole behind the horizon is long only because you set some boundary conditions at infinity. Yeah, yeah, that's right. From the point of view of any observer who comes in, they see no difference between this state and the other state. And you should be able to okay, consider the reconstruction in these states as well. This, this discussion is not about an observer. I understand. Yeah. I, I'm not saying something that's not true. Let me just leave what you said in the yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's true that um, that you know if you take if you start with the thermal field level states and you do interior reconstruction and then you go to these one extremely highly time shifted state like exponential level state, then you know you have to switch frames the same operator <coughs> goes on. So maybe you mean to say that you take some set of states that are within some range of complexity about a given state. So it's not necessarily low complexity with respect to thermal field oh. level state, which is often done in the community. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, think I, I think I see what you Maybe you mean a certain band of complexity here, which can be about something. Okay. To the extent of these, yeah. There may be a sense in which that's equivalent to, to what, what I'm describing. There, there will not be a, a reference state chosen in this in this context. <coughs> there, there, there is a sense in which the dictionary that I will define is, has a preferred basis of states, and I say more about this in the paper. Unfortunately, I won't say anything about it. But we can discuss it there. I suspect there is some relationship to these equilibrium state ideas of, of new and periodic things, and I wrote about it in, in the paper, but I, we can talk about it. That's, by the way, that's a difference compared to this paper. So I, I don't know if you've, if you've gone through this, this one completely, yeah. but in, in, in this paper, the ensemble that they study is independent of you know, the, a particular basis on, on the bulk and the boundary, because the, the ensemble that they use is the R ensemble unitary operators, which does not have a preferred basis. The code that we find in the West Coast model will have preferred basis in the bulk and boundary. Uh, this question. Yeah. So here this discrete set S is uh, infinite? infinite? Uh, oh, no, no, it's, it's fine. It's going to be a finite set S. Okay, so where would you break down? Because you just put in this criteria, psi uh, and W psi belongs to S. So. You mean that the W to the power n psi will not belong to this? Yeah, so, so for, for example, for if, uh, if the state that you choose does not belong to S, this W tilde may not exist. So there will be some large n for which W to the power n psi will not be in S? Uh, it, it depends on the orbit of, of W, but it, it could be. If, if W, if, if you have in mind that W kind of explores the whole bulk Hilbert space in a in, in a, like a discrete manner, then yes. But if W has you know, a closed orbit of bulk states, all of which lie in S, then no. That was a little bit fast. Okay, the other thing is that, uh, maybe you're going to explain your next slide, if not uh, then. Uh, so, uh, where does this exist, where does this S come in in this proof? In this, uh, in this ah, I'll, I'll explain. You'll explain. Uh, yeah, I'll, so the, the goal, one, one of the technical the only technical thing I hope to convey in, in this talk is an estimate of the rough size of S. That will, that will take some time. Okay. Now, 
A useful method to verify the state-specific error correction criterion is called the decoupling principle. So the decoupling principle essentially is this formula uh, subject to this quantity on the left-hand side should be less than or equal to epsilon squared. Epsilon is, again, some small error parameter. And the left-hand side of this formula is not hard to understand. It's the difference between the squared norms of two states. So this first one is the squared norm of L, W, psi. And the second one is just the squared norm of L, psi. Now, it's not hard to see that this implies the existence of W tilde, that is state dependent again, that we had on the previous slide. Sorry, I still don't understand from here where does this set S comes in? Here, here I'm not saying anything about S yet. It, it will be clear later why <coughs> this sort of thing can only be true for a subset of the states. But at the moment, we're just speaking abstractly. You can consider a fixed W and a fixed side, for example. What I'm describing here is a theorem that says this upper line implies the existence of W tilde in the lower line. That's what <coughs> So let's say why that is true. Why does the upper line imply the lower line, or at least the existence of W tilde, which, which satisfies the lower line? Uh, it's intuitive because if L acting on the side and LW acting on the side have approximately the same norm, which is what this left hand side is, uh, they are approximately related by a unitary rotation in W tilde. Now the state dependence is present because we cannot guarantee that the same rotation will work for any choice of side in this set S. So this is a natural type of set S for any non-isometric code L. So this is the sort of set that we would consider. It's a set of states in H code which have approximately preserved overlaps or norms after the action of L. So in equations, what that means is we first compute the overlap of two states, psi 2 and psi 1, and we compare it to the overlap after we've acted with the say that that difference, or the magnitude of that difference, should be bounded by some small error. And we will use this as a guiding principle to construct this set S. So we will study... Can you go back and remind me what yeah. W tilde was? I mean, not just a big thing, but yeah, you said unitary yes. rotation. Yes. Unitary. Now, unitary transformations, there are... Well, this is not just isometric. This is this really is unitary, so it has to be one to one. So, uh, um, let's see. Are unitary main, uni, just the unitary transformations? Are they not defined entirely on Hilbert space? Oh, they yeah, are. yeah, yeah. Well, but so side is not between, for between, between one Hilbert space and the same Hilbert space. So here, this and the is, same, but yeah. psi does not. I believe you say does not belong to. No, no, no. Psi is a vector in a Hilbert space. This set S does not form a Hilbert subspace. But it is a set of states in a Hilbert space, and I can act on such states with unitary operators. Okay. And the target, the W tilde, happens according to S as well. Uh, this W tilde exists. Uh, well, I'll say more about when this W tilde exists. So it's a unitary rotation on the full Hilbert space, not on S. On the physical Hilbert space. Yeah, so this, this W tilde, in principle, is defined on the whole physical Hilbert space. So its action is defined on S, on S complement, on everything. Well, it's not so clear, since you have only mm -hmm. used the existence of W tilde. Mm -hmm. That existence, the existence is not defined throughout the The entire existence of W tilde, which satisfies this inequality. W tilde is just an operator. Yes, but it is defined only as its action on, on things on form. Uh, are, so, are you asking if this rotation is ambiguous? It is, to a certain extent. But I can I pick a highly ambiguous, and it's so ambiguous that I don't understand how you can possibly call it unitary, because it only seems to be defined on the since psi belongs to S. Sorry, why, why can I not call a rotation in a Hilbert space a unitary operation? It's not in a Hilbert space. It's only defined no, in the S, state of the form okay. del psi. S, S is a subspace. Mm -hmm. This, the action of this, the purpose well, of this. You define form, the action on state states that looks like del psi. This formula does not define. The this, this formula is a criterion which W tilde is an operator that satisfies. But W tilde is an operator on its own space. So you see there's the existence thing here. Yes. Okay, so you see there exists a W tilde that, that satisfies. That, that actually is the full, that somehow is a generalization of this thing. That what? Or that, that is an extension of this thing to the entire Hilbert space. This is not a definition. This is a criterion 
that W tilde satisfies. Okay. So W tilde is, is a nonlinear operator. It's a map. I'm not sure what you mean by that. It w is tilde it. is a unitary operator, so it is. So that's a sound very linear. It depends on the C. That's nonlinear, right? I mean, if you add, think of it actually yeah. like linear. Linearity is, is not a question here. This W tilde is just a unitary operator, which is a linear operator. I haven't said anything about evolution or anything. I understand, I'm not saying it's not a linear evolution, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, so that you feel that is it is it uh, then, then I'm not sure what you mean by linear in that case. If we're not talking about evolution. But linear it works from a Hilbert space to a Hilbert space. But if you have a linear map that depends on what state it's acting on, then it ain't linear. You should think of these formulas as for fixed W and yeah. This this formula is not meant to imply an existence of W tilde for arbitrary states of sign. It's meant that if I evaluate this quantity for a fixed W and a fixed side, I have the implication that there exists a W tilde operator which will depend on side. Good. So W tilde from that point of view, you're saying is just something that takes a single basis vector exactly. in the Hilbert space to another one. Exactly. The and there are obviously many that do that because how they act on all the other basis other vectors, vectors, never mind. Absolutely. Okay. There are many. But why are you calling this error correction? There's no error here. Uh, so I, I have in mind, you know, this this is the trivial error correction condition, okay. which is actually not trivial in the non-isometric case. Cool. But if you want real error correction, like you're used to, you would you would require that this W tilde should act on a subspace of the physical Hilbert space in the same way as before. Yeah. Um, so this, I mean, how does W tilde depend on W? Does it depend linearly in W? <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure what you mean by linear because if you know, the, the, the sum of two unitary operators is not a unitary operator. So it, it's true that this W tilde you know, will, will depend on what W is, but the dependence is not true. Maybe what's confusing is that you haven't defined W tilde yet, and right now you've just told us it's actually a single state. So whether it's unitary or not is not even relevant in this state. That's well, well, well it could be extended from that into something that acts with the rest sure. of the I mean, If you give me one, uh, something that takes one state, I can always extend it to you. That's what he's saying. That sounds like a non-objectionable statement, also not a very powerful one. But. Yeah, no, it's fine. But I just need to see. Maybe what's confusing is maybe if you define W to the... Well, the, the, the purpose of this theorem is to give us a way to check when W tilde exists, when there is some operator that does the job of satisfying this formula. So given a state psi and an operator W, you need to tell me when this W tilde exists that satisfies the bottom line, and I have told you that the top inequality implies the existence. So, and can you remind me what is L? Is that L here? Is L, is the, L is the encoding time. Any of That maps the code space to the physical space. It's just highly unusual to define unitary operator for, for one basis vector at a time, there is and, nothing and, being defined. and being told yeah. absolutely say, oh yeah, but do not compare how it acts on one basis vector versus another one. And that's a different W, sorry. So you can't, uh, wow, that's, that's, that's a that's right. pretty, pretty from, from that novel, point of view, <laughs> you know, it's a large family of W yeah. tilde you've defined. But I, I want to emphasize here that this theorem is going to allow us to argue when W tilde exists and when it does not. So W tilde depends on the, yeah, sorry, maybe I'm repeating yeah. the same objections, but when it depends on psi, then how is it useful, perhaps that's what? It's, it depends on psi, but its existence is not trivial. That's the crucial. Okay. No, but uh, okay, but it should also be useful in letting you construct operators. It is not letting you construct operators. Oh, this this theorem does not tell you how to construct. Not how to. W -tilde. Not how to. But this existence is not also of the operator. You are not constructing an operator given an operator. No. Right. You 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 are given a state really. Thus, you are given a state. This side and two states. this W operator. Yeah, so two states. W side. Exactly. Yeah. And this W tilde is supposed to recreate the action, the, the rotation from side to W side mm -hmm. on the physical open space. It's confusing. Why is its existence not obvious? Like, what is not trivial yeah. about the existence of that trivial? For the reason that I described down here, the existence after you have this criterion is trivial. But if this is not true, W tilde does not exist. It can't be extended to a unitary. No, I, I mean, if this is not satisfied, there is no W tilde. 
Let's, but let's he's saying that if, when, if, the double, if the putative W tilde acts on the one state it's going to possibly act on, and it happens to act on it in a non-preserving non way, then it mm -hmm. obviously cannot become a unitary operator. Exactly. The, the point is that if this L were to change the norm of psi or W psi greatly, then there is no unitary operator. Yeah, I guess the point is uh, the norm cannot be preserved in a non isomorphic way. And it will not be preserved. Because of the null space. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So de dealing with the null space carefully it yeah. is the meat of this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. So the next <laughs> type of set S that we will consider is a set of states in H code, which have approximately preserved overlaps or norms after the action of the L. Because as we just had a discussion about, these are the states for which the existence of W tilde is rather trivial. If the encoding map does not change the overlaps or norms of some set of states S, then the action of a unitary W on that state, on that set of states, which preserves it, will give rise to a W tilde, which can be reconstructed in some sense. So, in other words, to say, to say that in a different way, the discrete sets S, uh, the discrete state sets S that we will consider are those upon which L acts almost like an isometry. So one of the ways to phrase some of the results in, in this talk is what is the set of states, the semi-classical states, upon which the holographic dictionary can pretend to be an isometry, upon which its non-isometric properties are very non-obvious. Null states are an example of where this non-isometry is very obvious, for example. But how big can I, can I take these discrete I guess, and still pretend to be an isometry. You just need non-physical map, right? Yeah, this, this is roughly, oh, oh, so the, these overlaps include the case where psi1 is equal to psi2. So that's the norm. Oh, but only that is fine, right? Why do you want it to be this overlap stuff? Also? Yeah, that, that's, the, the norms turn out to imply the overlaps at the cost of some, some factors. I, I just don't want to deal with the factors. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the most basic question about non isometric so one question that I, I want to answer in this talk is then to understand the properties of such sets S, including their typical size, so that typical size is what we will be concerned with, and the allowed subspace reconstructions in each bit. So this has to do with Onkar's question. We may or may not have time to it. But it, it has to do with the case when H physical has multiple factors, and in so multiple tensor factors, and there's a question of when you are allowed to reconstruct the unitary operator that you're interested in on only one of the tensor factors. That is this non-trivial error correction that Omkar was referring to. It, it turns out that in this case, as, as I stressed, the global reconstruction itself is not trivial. So we will mostly deal with that. Uh, can I ask, is, is this a definition of S? Uh, this is, you can think of it as a definition of one type of S. A set of states which upon which this encoding map acts almost like an isometry. That's, that's not a definition, right? There are many such sets which satisfy that. We're going to try to understand how big can such sets be. No, but is there not a notion of a maximal set? Which it may be ambiguous, right? So you, you may have multiple maximal sets which are disjoint, they may have overlap. We so won't it's not like there is one set which contains It's also. not like there is one set. Yeah. But where do you need this in the previous... Uh, Statements. Okay. So in the previous statements, I, I don't need this. this. Now I'm talking about S. On the previous slide, I was not talking about any specific statement. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. So here, here we were just talking abstractly about specific states and unitary operators. This had nothing to do with S. Yeah, but what I'm confused is that where, where does discrete set come in for the existence of W tilde? I mean, it, well, it well, why do you need a discrete set? Ah, well, if, if you can prove on, you won't be able to prove, in general, that L acts like an isometry on a full continuum of states, right? That has the same codimension as the full Hilbert space. If you were able to prove that by linearity, you would prove that L is basically an isometry. Yeah, but you don't need L to be an isometry to begin with, right? That's L, right. no, it's not a matter of need. There is a fact that L is not an isometry in these situations that I will study. Yeah, I'm just confused about um, the the statements that you made in the previous slide, didn't this one? 
Yes. Yes. This has nothing doesn't to seem to assume us. that Psi uh, it's, it's some yeah. criteria. This, this I naturally don't see why Psi should belong to a discrete set. And you should because this has nothing to do with it. But then you could all, all that this says is a criterion which we can check, which will imply the existence of a different unitary operator which satisfies this criterion. No, so do, do, do you need the, you need a discrete set S because you can you have also do like subs go to go to subspace regression. No, you just that you cannot do better. You have to exactly. have this discrete set. Yeah. This discrete set. You have to have a discrete set. Would you insist that the span of S is equal? Uh, there is no span. I won't. No. You have no span, so that's a vector space thing, isn't it? Yeah, but it's it's be, it's right? because if the, the span happens to be less than the image span, image yeah. dimension, then it, it yeah. ends up being the isometric code. That's it. Yeah. More or less. I, I won't insist on that, but <laughs> it, it will turn out that you know the, the size of S we will estimate is more than big enough yeah. to, to span the whole. But S, you just said it's a set. It has no structure whatsoever. It could S be it is a set of elements in a vector in a Hilbert space. I can consider the span. So it is a metric space. set, for example. So you actually have a topology. No. It is a well, no, but it inherits it inherits an inner product between yes. any two any two states in S and yes. an inner product with one another. Yes. So therefore I can define a norm. Yes. And therefore I'm wondering, is the space complete with respect to that norm? Can I take limits? Uh That's yes, a, because S should be a finite. In other words, so S is a topological space. Is there a discrete topology, I suppose? You're going to have to explain to me what a topological space and a discrete topology are. That I, can, uh, that I can take limits, that I can take a sequence of limits. Yes, yes. Then, then the answer is yes, because, because S is discrete. Yeah. So I think there's no... There's, no, no, of course, yes. there's only a finite it's set, so what do I talk it's a about? Yeah. But you can still talk about topology, discrete topology, but... Yeah. yeah. That's fine. But, but, uh, but, it, but there is a... I mean, they, at the end of the day, they do live in it. They do live in it. At the end of the day, I think that, talk about that was fact. the confusion. So I, I, what Abhijit was asking is just, given this set S of vectors in Hilbert space, I can consider their spec. Now, many of those elements will not actually be in the set S, really? but they will be members of the Hilbert space. So when you say size, you actually mean the number? I mean the number. I mean, one, there would be just a two-dimensional space and a whole lot of uh, numbers. Also. I mean, it would be a big set also. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. So absolutely. at the end of the day, I think the span is irrelevant. You have to at least show that the span is bigger than the dimension of the image. Then that would be then the non-reality is there. Well, when when we estimate the number, or the size that this discrete set can have, it will be much much larger than the dimension of the physical Hilbert space. No, that is what I'm saying. That's right. Two dimensions also, you can have yeah. millions of vectors, of right? So the size of a set will not give you any idea about uh, the well, dimension of one, its band. One needs to consider the scaling of this size of the set S with the physical space dimension. So you need to understand how much bigger it is. <coughs> how many to estimate how many states you have? Be Not it won't be exponential. But I just don't understand what does the size of the set have to do with it? It's, shouldn't it be the, the dimension of the span? Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, yeah. That, yeah. That, that, it's just the space. Or the line takes points. No, the, the, the dimension. The dimension of the span, as you said, in a two-dimensional space, you can have a million vectors. Yeah. If I take the span of those, I get two. That's, That's right. not meaningful. That's right. The That's right. So therefore, it was uninteresting. Even so, the, the size of that number, set was it uninteresting? The, no, the meaningful number in that case is the one million. That is the number that we're interested in. No, why? Yeah. Say that. Because that's it. <coughs> well, I, maybe you can answer this as well. But that is the set of states upon which semi-classical physics will be formed or will work in some sense. No, but if this happens to be less than the physics, the span happens to be the less less than the dimension of H phase. Just happens to be. I don't know whether it is or not. Okay. But it, at least that it is not that the, the dimension of the span should be greater than H space is a condition that should be there, right? Otherwise, it just ends up becoming an isometric embedding. I mean, I might use, I might use, I might as well use the isometric embedding. It's not a. Maybe I'm not understanding what you're saying. But no, this no, is not. Yeah, this, 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 this is the way I understand this broad story. Okay. It's just, so please correct me if this is not. Clear. So at least this is the thing that the point that Rajiv and I made some time ago, which is, and please tell me if this is, let's say you take a very high dimension space. You ask how many vectors can I find in this space, which are, you know, which have the property that they are almost orthogonal. Not exactly. If you have a space of dimension n, how many spaces, vectors are exactly orthogonal? Exactly n. How many vectors are, 
are approximately orthogonal. Yes. And that's much larger if n is very large. It's almost, it's exponential in n. Okay. So it's e to the n. So if you say, so I mean that's a discrete set of vectors, yes. all of which are approximately orthogonal. Of course, if you take the span of them, you get n again. But it, it, this is a property of high dimension spaces. And it comes from the way high dimension volumes grow. You know, no, no, but, but I agree, I remember this story also. Yeah, that's, that's, that's but the point is, what you said at the end, the yeah. span of it is n. The span of it is n. If, if, if in this story the span of that s, z s turns out to be the dimension of h code, yes. then I will be happy. But I was saying, is that one of the statements it that would come be, out? It will be in this model. Okay. Yes. The, the span, a set of vectors which spans the semi classical number space yeah. will indeed exist in the set s. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The span but, has but not only those, there will be many more. No, the span is the full thing. The but span, not in the span will be bigger than each code. The span will be equal to the dimension of the semi classical space. So H -code. within this, yes. Yeah, that's that's it. You cannot even go bigger than the same spaces. And the span will be smaller than H small H capital B, right? That's all that takes. Span and that's probably fine. Even if the number of states is very large. No, no, no. Why, no, why, no. Why, why? These are states in the semi classical space. I don't. Why? Why is the span in the minus? Let's say I look at the dimension of of all of these states. Yes. I think all that's being said is if you look at the dimension yes. of this mm -hmm. little space, the true dimension, that's smaller than the dimension of the boundary space. That's true. That, that's fine. I, I don't know what you mean by the true dimension. There, there is a span which will be equal to the semi classical vector space dimension, which is larger than the microscopic dimension. Yeah, so that's fine. Yeah, then that's fine. That's what Start I'm the, the span, <coughs> the, the true dimension, so well, then, then it's not what, what I'm saying. What do you mean by true dimension? So, I have, so what I was saying was in a high dimension space, you can find a lot of vectors which are approximately orthogonal. Yes. But now, if you take these vectors and you try and take the dimension, yeah. that is the same as the original dimension. That you can find like. <coughs> In a hundred dimensional space, maybe you can find a thousand vectors, all yes. of which are very small in a product. But the the dimension of that thousand vectors, if you take the span, is hundred. Yes. I mean, that's, that's right. Probably that, true. That, that will be true. But here, well, here we have a map between two Hilbert spaces, which is the dictionary. You, you can consider the span of you know the, the states before the map and the span of the states after the map. In both cases, they will be maximum. But the span before is larger. In, in the, just because the dimension before the map is larger than the dimension after the map. If you take this discrete set of states and yes. you imagine that it lives in a much higher dimensional uh, vector space, right? Well, the span of that will be a much higher dimensional vector space. Right? No, no, this, this discrete set of states lives in the semi classical space. I know, but that's a much higher dimensional vector space then, then what? than the physical Hilbert space. Yes. I, I think that is what Sobrat was starting with two have, dimensions. The set of states you have in the semi classical space spans the semi classical space. I understand. So that's much higher than yeah, what yeah. Subrat was calling the true dimension. Yes. Which is Absolutely. the physical space. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, so just to see what, what yeah. I, that, that I understand, the span of S is equal to dimension of H code. Yes. Yes. Okay. Fine. Okay. Good. So again, we want to estimate the size of this. Okay, so now we'll turn to the toy model of this black hole here. This is sometimes called a PSS1 model or the West Coast model. It was written down in this paper. And what it involves is uh, ADS2 JT gravity with non dynamical end of the world frames. So the role of the end of the world frames is to source some bulk entropy. That was the role in this model. Uh, for us, the end of the world frames will span the semi classical. Here's the, here's the action, which is written for completeness. Um, it's appeared, I think, in other talks in this workshop. Uh, what we will do is construct a non isometric dictionary V that sends semi classical to microscopic states by using the Euclidean pattern to promote this gravity theory and its alternative tool. Uh, let me just say that mu is the tension of the brain. So that's one extra parameter. So let me just briefly review the Euclidean pattern integral technology. Probably everybody knows this, but just stop me if you have any questions. So the simplest Euclidean pattern integral prepares the thermal partition function. That's given by this expression. And in the microscopic theory, the Euclidean manifold in question is a circle with circumference beta. The line segment represents the Euclidean evolution, this e to the minus beta h operator that appears here, where h is the Hamiltonian, and joining the endpoints generates the trace. Now in the semi-classical theory, one needs to fill in this boundary circle 
And the Euclidean manifold in question is a disk with a hyperbolic metric that fills in this boundary circle. And the boundary of this disk has a renormalized circumference here. So the circumference is diverging, but the strength of that divergence is beta. So pictorially, oh, okay, there should be gray in this one, unfortunately. So on the left, you should imagine that this circle is filled in with a gray disk. That's, uh, that's what you should have in your mind. Unfortunately, it doesn't show up on the projector. Uh, now, we have two Euclidean manifolds. This one on the left is the bulk manifold, and on the right, there's a boundary manifold. To create states, we cut open the path integrals along a Cauchy slice. This leaves the semi-classical space, a state that we'll call a lowercase TFD, that lives on this slice, and the microscopic state, capital TFD, which lives on two points, these two boundary points. Now, the expressions in JT gravity are given by these expressions here. Uh, if you're not familiar with the JT theory, don't worry too much about it. Uh, the important thing is that this is a, a continuous sum over some medium energy eigenstates uh, in the bulk. And in the boundary state, you have a discrete sum over a tensor product over a space. So we have two energy eigenstates of the boundary level 20, weighted with the usual Boltzmann. This row is the JT density that comes from the Schwarzian path integral. Okay. Uh, this lack of gray is really. Uh, Maybe you can draw it on the. Ah, yes, sure. Here. So, what this picture should look like is this. So, you should imagine that this. On the left is filled in. Now, the dictionary V acts by hollowing out the interior of the semi classical path integral and leaves behind the microscopic path integral. So V acts on this little TFD and gives us the big TFD state. And the way that that happens is you take the left path integral, this object we have here, and you hollow out this, this interior and you're left with the boundary circle. The retardant, could you just yeah. go back one? One. Yes. The rho E is what? Rho E is this cinch, this particular function of energy. It's not immediately clear to me that that's what that state is. Um, because that's okay. some sort of quantitative. What? Which which part of uh, of this expression is? Are you unhappy with? Usually we think in the bulk of this as a Hartle Hawking. State, right? It is. And yeah. this you've written in a particular basis. Usually yeah, we yeah. write it in some length basis or something. Oh, no, no, no. I don't. Well, it, no, no, no. Good. Here, I'm cutting the path integral, but okay. I'm not placing boundary conditions. If, if you want to place a boundary condition of a fixed length, you will have an L here. So that, let me, let me draw. Uh, sorry, write it. So what I'm, draw, what I'm constructing by taking this slice and not placing boundary conditions is this text. If you want to write the Harlow Hawking wave function in the L basis, you need to put an L state I on the left hand side. Yeah, but this is written in some other basis, right? No, no, no. It's, it's this state, TFD, is written in the energy basis. That's yeah, yeah, it. that's okay. Yes. So this is just the bulk, the, the standard Harlow Hawking state written in the energy basis. There is no other. What other expression do you have in mind? Well, I could have written it in the length basis. It, but in the length basis, you mean this? Yeah. Okay, but these are two different, this, this is a number, or a wave function, if you like, that depends on L. That is a state in the Hilbert space. I understand. So I could have used, in the, used this wave function to write the state in the length basis. By, but, but that would not be this expression. That would involve I understand. integrating, the, you would have yeah, to put a 1. Yeah, but right, I'm just trying different. to understand whether this is a different basis, as opposed to the length basis. Right? It, it is, it's the energy okay. basis. This is so the this, energy basis. This E is the ADM energy, it's the asymptotic energy. Yeah, no, but but why those? The, what why is that the wave function? Rho e and z minus b. Okay. Maybe this one, is a good question. No, no. One one way to see that this is the wave function is to do the calculation that gives you this to, to do the path integral that gives you this number. If you do that path integral, you will find that the expression is almost like this. But instead of this e, you have an inner product of the l and e basis in JT. That is the special k function that maybe you're, you're familiar with. But the point is that from that. From this set of numbers, you can read off what the exact coefficients are of this state. Okay. Uh, good. 
So that was a rather technical question, but the important part of this section of the talk is, is this line. The fact that the dictionary B acts by hollowing out the interior of the sentence. <coughs> that will be the important part. So the thermofield double state creates the empty one. And now we want to put something in the interior. Uh, let me just see. Okay. A little bit short on time. Uh, to create an excitation in the interior, we insert one of these boundary frames, one of these end of the world frames. So what that does on the left here is inserts this particle propagating in the interior that I've drawn as a red line. And this end of the world frame just removes the rest of the space time behind the particle. So now it's really, in some sense, in the interior from the right boundary perspective. Now, the corresponding boundary state is this one, the capital VR state. And I've given the expressions here. So they look very similar to the expressions on the previous slide. It's just you have this extra F mu factor, which I've written here. It's just some gamma function that depends on the tension and also the energy. Uh, and the capital VR state has that same F mu function, uh, but it has an important factor here, the CN. So these CNs, I'll say more about what they are shortly, but these are the crucial objects that will enter in our dictionary. The energy and tension dependence is not so important. We're going to get rid of it shortly. But the action of the dictionary on the semi-classical state, again, gives the boundary state. It's capital PR. Okay. The coefficient Cn, which are the important things that I mentioned before, are complex Gaussian random variables with zero mean and unit variance. So the expression that I wrote on the previous slide was actually an ensemble of states. The appearance of this ensemble is related to all these recent discussions of ensemble averaging and gravity. We'll, we'll say a bit more about that. Uh, but for now, let me go a little bit further with this model, uh, in the same way that the West Coast uh, people did, by adding some number of flavors of frames. So by adding you know, this uh, size of V flavors of frames, where this V is whatever we left, we can create different types of interior executions and define HPD as the span of these states. Now, the different flavors are non interacting and these states will be orthogonal in the semi-classical description. In the microscopic theory, what this does is it extends the set Cn of complex Gaussian random coefficients to a set Cnc, where C labels the brain flavor. Now, passing to the microcanonical ensemble, where that means fixing the coarse grained energy instead of the inverse temperature data, eliminates the tension mu and smooth energy E dependence of the state coefficients, and also makes this H big B finite. So the upshot of this portion of the talk is on this slide. So if you followed nothing previously, just try to, uh, try to follow this. Uh, the upshot of all of this is that the dictionary B in this toy model of the interior is proportional to a complex Gaussian random matrix with independent entries. So that's summarized by this model right here. So B is nothing more than a normalized complex Gaussian random matrix. And C is drawn from this ensemble. Complex normal, unit, unit variance, zero mean, we have quite a few of them. We have H big B times H little B in terms of the number of coefficients. And again, the fact that an ensemble of dictionaries appears is related to recent discussions of ensemble averaging in low dimensional gravity. So our goal here is going to be to study the properties of this ensemble and in some sense compute the typical size of a state S that we had before. Okay, so we need one more ingredient to make the black hole evaporate. And that's to add one of these radiation reservoirs. So there's some so so yeah. When you talk about ensemble and averaging and yeah. so on, at the level of the map, yeah. uh, then what is the meaning of unitarity? Because you have taking, uh, you're mapping, you're taking sums and all these, uh, what does unitarity mean? Unitarity of what? Of the map. Or the, the map is the map the were isometric. isometric. Yeah. Let's say if the map were isometric yeah. and mm -hmm. also an ensemble type, yeah. what does isometric, what would then, uh, being isometric mean. then our strategy would be to compute whatever particular quantity we're interested in, in the error correction framework, like this decoupling principle, for example, in a particular theory. Now, so we'll fix the theory and do our computation, and then we'll average over the theories. Okay. And if something is correctable you know, in every theory, we'll get the result that is correct. It's a distinction between quenched and you know, averaging. Mm -hmm. We'll always do quenched and well. This, this form of the dictionary comes from a quenched average calculation. So this is really the microscopic model. Okay, so to make the black hole evaporate, we'll add this reservoir HR. Uh, 
<coughs> this allows us to consider entangled states between the interior excitations, in other words, the brain flavors, and the radiation. So, Arjun, in, yeah. in this previous model, uh, what was the set S? It was just the brain states. In, in which, which previous this model that you introduced? I haven't said anything about this. Oh, you're going to say yeah, it. I'm, I'm okay. going to. Okay. Yeah. This, yeah, so, so in, in the Euclidean construction of the dictionary, there's nothing about S. Okay. Yeah. And they're all vector spaces so far. It, they're all vector spaces. We will see that we are only powerful enough to prove that error correction will be supported in a discrete set of states S, and that's the best you can move for. Good, okay. So this, again, allows us to consider entangled states. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, the use of these radiation reservoirs to derive things like the page curve of uh, Hawking radiation. Um, and what we will do in this case is extend the dictionary by the identity on the radiation reservoir. So we're just going to declare that the microscopic radiation is the same as the set of classical radiation. This is a fairly standard construction. Um, you could do other things, but this will be enough for us. Good. So we now turn to studying the properties of this ensemble of dictionaries. Where again, this is the ensemble. C is some rectangular matrix uh, drawn from the complex normal ensemble uh, with this dimension. And we have tensor on the identity. So the dimensions of these guys, H both are infinity, right? Because they were labeled by mu, the states were labeled by mu or something. Ah, mu is, uh, is the tension. So there, the mu we've gone rid of by going to the microcanonical ensemble. They're, they're labeled by a flavor. So this, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this, uh, we added some flavors, which is just some topological number. Okay. Yeah. So that's, we, uh, that's H code, dimension of H code. That will be the, well, H code is the mm -hmm. semi-classical semi space, tensor the radiation. So the radiation has some dimension, it is whatever it is, but the semi-classical space has dimension equal to the number of flavors. And what about H phys? H phys has dimension equal, so there are two factors again in H phys. There's the microscopic filter space, and again the radiation. So the radiation is, it, it is yeah, what it is. And this one has the dimension of the black hole microscope, the micro-canonical filter space. So it's E to the S, where S is the entropy. But B for now here is the sigma. Isometry or a number? Ah, V here, it depends on, so it is, it, it can be an approximate isometry if we have very few flavors of brains. But if we have very many flavors of brains, more than the black hole entropy, it, okay. V will not be even close to an isometry. Other questions? Okay. So we will now use this ensemble to study average error correction. <laughs> This is related to a previous question. Specifically, our goals are to study the typical size of the discrete states at S, which have preserved overlaps and the allowed subsystem reconstructions. Okay, we, we won't get to this, but ask me about it later. Uh, using the, so that is proceeds by using the decoupling principle. Uh, let me skip this other question. Um, and there's some consistency condition with entanglement web reconstruction for the experts. So the ensemble that we have found is a high-dimensional Gaussian distribution on a complex Euclidean manifold. Now to study its average properties as a family of non-symmetric codes, we will use mesh concentration. These te techniques were pioneered by these authors. So roughly speaking, measure concentration is a property of certain probability distributions on Riemannian manifolds, which allows one to use low moments of sufficiently well-behaved functions to put strong bounds on the probability of deviations from the mean. Now the main theorem that we need states that something called a kappa Lipschitz function has g has bounded deviations with probability that is exponentially suppressed in one over kappa. Uh, so that's captured by this uh, expression. So we have some function uh, where c is the random variable that we're interested in, and the probability in this uh, ensemble that the actual value of g exceeds the mean value of g. So this integral over dc of g gives the mean value. Uh, the probability that there is a fluctuation of size epsilon is strongly bounded, so it's less than some exponentially small thing uh, in one over kappa squared. So what that means is, if kappa is a very small number, then this is the exponential of minus a very large number. And that gives us a very strong bound on this probability. So the notion of a kappa Lipschitz function formalizes our well-behaved criteria. So that's what we mean by well-behaved function. 
And the capital matrix function G is one which has changes bounded by the geodesic distance of the underlayer on the other. So what that means is that the difference between G evaluated at two points uh, with the absolute value is upper bounded by this particular quantity, uh, which is uh, the trace norm in matrices, but the Riemannian norm uh, on the Euclidean space multiplied by kappa. So kappa is a constant which allows us to bound such changes. So the function that we're going to consider is this f, f of c, uh, which measures the norm of a state after applying the encoding map f. So f is defined this way. Uh, notice that there's a state here. So I'm, I'm not telling you what the state is. It's some fixed state uh, in the growth space. Now, you can compute the Lipschitz constant for f. Uh, you find that it is very small. It is actually e to the minus s over 2, uh, where s is the black hole entropy. Uh, and you, that allows you to apply measure concentration and something called the union bound. And what you find is a bound on pairwise overlap preservation in some state set S. So this bound, I want to stress, holds for any set S, any set of states that you like. But of course, you can see that the size of this set appears in the bound because of the techniques used in the proof. So if S <coughs> had infinitely many states, this bound would be completely trivial. It would not say anything. But S, what, what this formula on the right-hand side allows you to do is estimate the size of S, for which this probability will be small. So let's, let's talk about the interpretation of this, uh, this formula on the next slide. So the meaning of this bound is the following. So this, this is <coughs> the main workhorse of, uh, of the paper, or the, one of the main results of the paper. So let me just explain that and then finish up. So, the meaning of this bound is that as long as the size of S is parametrically smaller than this particular quantity, so gamma is just some small number, it's between 0 and 1 half. Uh, as long as S is parametrically smaller than this combination, again, HB is the microcanonical Hilbert space of the black hole, so this combination is doubly exponential in the entropy, then the right hand side is small when this black hole Hilbert space is much greater than 1. This dimension is much greater. That's just because there's no way that this combinatorial factor can overwhelm the exponential suppression that we have here. Uh, when if, if S is parametrically smaller than this one. So what that means is that the size of S has a bound where the right-hand side is guaranteed to be small. So if S is less than or equal to this combination of the black hole entropy, where alpha is bounded in this way, then we can guarantee that the right-hand side is small. So what happens when the right-hand side when the right-hand side is small, there is a very high probability that a randomly chosen encoded L from our ensemble that we were considering will approximately preserve all pairwise overlaps in S to within an error given by this combination, B to the minus gamma. And again, this is suppressed exponentially in the black hole entropy. You can think of this combination as E to the minus gamma S, where S is the entropy. Uh, may I ask something? Yeah. But here, you are just choosing, uh, there is no more uh, fundamental definition of S, you are simply... It's a, it's a result that holds for any S. Any S, but, uh, so what makes you choose uh, the subset? <coughs> Not, at, at this level, there is no statement about choice of S at all. The only thing we have done here is what I promised you that we would do, which is estimate the size, the maximal size, that S can be expected to have. Unless something very unusual happens, if we choose S to have this particular size and then close our eyes and choose a random encoding L, we will be very likely to have approximate preservation of norms. So what do you have in mind for gamma? So you said it was a number between yeah. zero and a half. So the, the appearance of this gamma is a rather technical thing. Yeah, I'm, but, but I'm so B, capital B, you have in mind is basically S, S here being the entropy, sorry. Exactly. That's what it's normally called. So, the, um, so, the, so then I thought that often this non orthogonality thing was thought to be about e to the minus a half S. In other words, I would have thought maybe I should take gamma equal to a half, which actually you're telling me no. That, that's a bit so, yeah. so, okay, so, so, so certainly in the ETH and other density matrices where we have off diagonal components, E to the minus a half S is common. But that's a half in the prefactor. That's not a half in the exponent. Yeah. Oh. I mean, this is a, that's E to the minus S by 2, so it's a half in the prefactor of the exponent. 
The other thing he's talking about that this I've is a little bit different. Gamma is sitting here for a different thing. Yeah. Is not e to the minus a half s? It is e to the minus half s, but that's just s divided by 2, as opposed to what he has here, which is something to the gamma is an exponent in the exponent. Yeah, but there is a b, b to the minus gamma then, right? Yeah, the first yeah, b is, is e to the to the s. So it's e to the minus gamma s. Yeah. It's e to the minus gamma b is. B is e to the entropy. B is e to the s. B is e to the s. Oh, so it's e to the 1 minus 2 gamma s. Oh, no, no, look at the first line. The first line is e to the minus s. This is a different issue. This is a question of. Yeah, this is. It's just that he was stating that they're very of giving a criterion for them being very orthogonal or being approximately, you know. If, yeah. And I would say, well, they're actually not that orthogonal. They're actually less orthogonal than I would have at least preferred them to be. I would have preferred, if, if gamma came out of half, I would just yeah. maybe. You would be happy. Well, I don't know. I would somehow like, yeah, oh, that's obvious, right? Or something. Isn't okay. that what everybody else got in something else or whatever? That's interesting. I, 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 would, I would have been surprised that even by half. But, but I can tell you, I usually think of gamma as one quarter. OK. And that is definitely between zero and a half. So pairwise over that is, is larger than e to the minus s by two. Yes. So the, the probability, yeah, let's let's just focus on what's inside these brackets momentarily. For, forget about what's on the right hand side. I made a big deal of it before, but let's come back to it. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. So earlier you said that uh, you want uh, this to be true for all semi-classical states. Uh, let, let, let me let me finish first. So and, and then we'll we'll come to semi-classical states. Um, the, the meaning of the thing that sits in this inequality is that if I have a set S, I consider all pairs of states in that set. And for all pairs of states, I compute this number. So the, the change in the norm. Remember, we had this at the beginning of the talk, computing the magnitude of the change in the norm. Now, I compute the maximum such magnitude for all pairs of states. So this, this is, in some sense, the worst that I can do. It's the worst case in the set S the two states that have their overlap preserved in the worst possible ways. It changes it the most. The probability that that worst case overlap change is greater than a very small number, e to the minus s over 4, or if gamma is 1 half, uh, the probability that that change is greater than this very small number is suppressed by the right-hand side. And we just discussed the case in which the right-hand side was small. When s, so the size of s is chosen appropriately, so, so in particular, if you demand that it be as, you shouldn't have anything with e to the minus s by 2, then the probability is not suppressed at all. If, if I, sorry. If you demand that the orthogonality be as good as e to the minus s by 2, uh -huh. then the probability is not suppressed at all. There so are lots of this, this <coughs> theorem, strictly speaking, does not hold for gamma equals 1 half. But I, I agree that if you take gamma equals 1 half, that is the implication. I see. So you can't find a lot of states which are almost orthogonal to e to the minus s by 2. Not e to the s over 2 of them. That's a bit, uh, or e, no, that's not e to the e to the s over 2. Uh, no, no, it's just you just want the norm to be uh, smaller than e to the minus s by 2. If you demand that, that's yes. too much. Yes, exactly. Yeah, then you find that you can't do it. You can't do it. Yeah, yeah I, I should say, since we're getting into this kind of technical detail, yeah. this, this restriction is the same between the, this uh, result that that was in my paper and this paper by Chris Akers and friends from the summer, but this is a bit stronger. So in, in their situation, there was a, a higher number that they had to assume. Yeah. You want cap to that to be really big anyway, right? You, you do want B to be very big, but it, it's kind of nice that it works, you know, all yeah. the way from black holes to two states. Maybe I can, you can, I can ask him yeah. that. Uh, so sh should I think of this as a bound on the, the size of s, basically, right? That's you, what I should You think. should think of this as a bound on the size of the typical s. And that is the yeah. back factor suppresses it, yes. this enhances it. And, okay, that's the, exactly. Okay, so yeah. here you talked about some probabilistic setting where you're, yes. you're drawing these uh, encoding maps from some ensemble and yes. you're looking at what is the probability that they are nice. Yes. And uh, the very high probability that they are nice. But let's see. So, so what subject what, to a, a choice of this size. Yeah, yeah, right. So we get to choose that, right? Um, now, if you work in the 
original setting, the way you define the problem, where there was no probabilistic uh, picking of the encoding map. That's right. Yeah. In that setting, uh, also, I mean, here it, it looks like if it is up to me, then I can easily solve the problem. Because you here you are talking about some probability that most of these encoding maps need to be nice. Well, right, but if I don't, if I just want to pick one map, which which is approximately yes. isometric. Yes, then you have to find a way to characterize the set of states yes. which will have their overlap preserved. Yeah, then it, it would be it, much bigger, right? I would, be, I would probably be allowed to have much bigger sets. It, it could be bigger, but I don't think it can be much bigger. The reason I don't think it can be much bigger is because, let, let's say you take this physical open space, right? And let's, how, how many states can I pack into the, the full physical open space? Just a priori, forget about error correction. Well, in order to figure that out, I can discretize this space, right? So this, this is a Hilbert space. Uh, if I think of it as you know, the sphere of unit norm unit vectors, it has a finite volume. So I can divide by some you know, epsilon ball of volume and count how many states there are in the Hilbert space by discretizing that volume. You can ask, well, what is that number? That number scales exponentially with the dimension. But it scales with some order one factor. Well, it scales as e to the b, or the, this b, times some log of the, the cutoff, this epsilon. So it scales rather mildly with the cutoff. You should think of the cutoff as like some order one factor. What we're seeing here, and I think you have a discussion of this. Yeah, good. So your question has brought us to the next slide. Uh, we can compare this to the total number of states in HB itself. So as I was saying, a projected Hilbert space has a finite volume, uh, and discretizing this volume with epsilon balls, a Hilbert space with dimension b has roughly this many states. So it has exponential in the dimension of the number of states, much like this, this log of 1 over epsilon, which you could think of as some order 1 number. Uh, so what that means is that you should not expect to be able to encode you know, every single, you should not expect that the code makes use of every single state in the physical space, right? Mm -hmm. Because that there is no room for error correction mm -hmm. if that happens. Mm -hmm. right? The number of states which you are really allowed to encode in you know, non-asymmetrically or asymmetrically, whatever, using whatever map you like, needs to be less than this number. And what we found is that it's a little bit less than that number. This alpha, you, know, you can think about it also as you know, one-fourth or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, no, but it cannot, be, it cannot be between half and one, right? It, it cannot be between half and so one. That's right? that's in that's 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 sense, it's small. You're, you're losing some information, but yeah. you should expect to lose something because right. this needs to be robust. But if I were to, if, if I'm allowed to pick only one L, which does the job, yeah. then that alpha would be three quarters. I, I don't have a proof that this alpha cannot be three quarters. I, I would be surprised if you can beat one half. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, in principle, it's possible. Yeah. I, what is clear is that if this alpha, if you, you know, try to push this alpha as far as you can, the robustness of the error correction will decrease. Okay. That that much will will, will happen. Okay. Um, let me just say this last thing. So the what that means is that the interior code manages to make fairly efficient use of the microscopic Hubert space modulo the, this question that I was raising while preserving semi classical overlaps parametrically well. Let me skip the. Uh, so this this was about uh, subspace reconstructions. Let me skip it. Okay, so what did we do technically? Uh, after reviewing expectations for isometric and non-isometric codes, uh, we constructed a non-isometric code or a family of such codes in dilaton gravity and studied its properties. Now, using measure concentration for the Gaussian distribution, we found that global operator reconstruction, uh, remember that works when the norm is preserved, can be supported for discrete states as S, which can be as large as some exponential in the black hole Hilbert space dimension for this bounded. <coughs> The result that I showed. Uh, and furthermore, so this, this part we didn't get to, uh, but let me just say that the allowed subsystem reconstructions, again using measure concentration argument, uh, can be shown to be consistent with the integral of the reconstruction. Sorry, uh, yeah. you said you would uh, explain this. So, does S contain all semi classical states? What's, what guides uh, some, that's, what's there any other physical? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, the, the hope is that S contains all states for which the semi-classical description produces predictions which are non-perturbative and close to the microscopic description. So that, that is the, the hope for S, but I haven't proven that to you today. That is not proven. That's not proven. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, good. So let me just discuss some interesting aspects, and then um, most mysteriously, the semi-classical field of space on interior excitations is requantized or discretized in the fundamental description. And certain states in the semi-classical description, like these null states that we need to mention, have no fundamental meaning. The number of states that can be described semi-classically is still very large, as we estimated, but the structure of truly typical interior states remains unclear and may involve firewalls. So this comes back to the point that we were making before, that the number of states we can encode is still smaller by a parametric fraction than the physical Hilbert space, than the number of states in the physical Hilbert space itself, as measured by the R measure, for example. Uh, let me just make a comment uh, for maybe uh, the more people who are familiar with this sort of thing. The fundamental averaging that we use to study typical properties is not expected to disrupt standard gravitational features like diffeomorphism and variance. But removing the averaging may require a better understanding of interior dynamics. This was discussed briefly in this paper. Yeah, if you say June was firewall, we don't need all of this. I mean, it's maybe possible mm -hmm. to encode a large number of states, but if you don't have a smooth interior, a growing interior, and so on, then maybe all this is not true. No, you, you certainly need this in order to understand the limits of semi classical physics in the interior. Right, but you know, if, if you have firewalls, there's no semi classical physics if, that can be wrong in it. The idea is that firewalls would be outside the set S. You say typical states, right? Truly typical interior states may involve firewalls. That's so right. Truly typical states involve firewalls. Then it's not clear that a set S has has much relevance. Why mean, not? Because you know the reason we say S is we say you know there's a semi-classical interior, the interior has a growing volume, and so you know you won't have to say. But you know if there's no interior, no states, then. But the when that's that's a fairly coarse characterization. You need to be a little bit more precise. When you say most states, what you mean is a fraction which approaches one as the black hole entropy goes to infinity. What I'm, what I'm telling you here is that there is already a problem in this interpretation of error correction long before that point, just after the page time actually, there's an issue which one needs to address, which is that the structure of this encoding map will be non-isometric. And then you have to say, how many states can I simulate semi-classical physics upon, or for which you expect semi-classical physics to be valid? And what has been argued today is a precise number or an estimate in this uh, Dillon gravity ensemble, for which semi-classical physics should be valid, where that means up to exponentially small corrections in the black hole entropy. So this is still a set of major zero, right? This is absolutely a set of major zero, yeah. In, in the whole Hilbert space, you know. yes. It's a discrete set. No, I mean, even if you discretize that uh, with a box and so on. Ah, um, well, it's, um, if, if you discretize the physical Hilbert space, you have uh, discrete, like some finite number of states, and I described a number which, which is, is smaller. Much, 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 much smaller. Much, well, it's, the fraction of these two numbers goes to zero as the black hole entropy diverges, but it's still, it's some fraction. Yes. So if, if the black hole entropy is finite, then this is a finite number. Yeah. I mean, I was just trying to understand this truly typical, that's what you mean by this. Ah, uh, uh, true, truly typical, I just mean a state drawn from the bottom. Yeah, which is yeah. unlikely to be one of these. Which is unlikely to be one of these, yes. in the limit of large, yes. large entropy. Yes. Okay, so let, me, uh, let me just go here. So the non-isometric structure that I described represents the current limit of semi-classical physics in the interior. It would be very interesting to prove that the Dillon-Hahn gravity code discussed here is asymptotically often. This is related to previous question also. Another one of these uh, At least when applying measure concentration techniques. I suspect that it is, but I, I don't have a proof. If true, it would mean that there is a parametric difference, which we were just discussing, between the total number of states, not just in phases, in a microcanonical window, and states with, which have reasonable semi-classical descriptions. Well, that means, technically, that operator expectation values match up to exponentially small corrections of the entropy. Now, whether the non-isometric structure can be extended to capture more of the microscopic Hilbert space using fancier techniques is unclear. In a more practical direction, the improvement in state size s uh, compared to this work that came out in the summer uh, it is actually parametrically blocked by a polynomial factor. Uh, so you should think of this as su suppose you think of uh, you know, th this paper as defining some algorithm, and the paper that I wrote is defining another algorithm. If this algorithm runs in time you know, x to the 12 or something, the algorithm that I've described to you today runs in linear. So there is a polynomial improvement in, uh, in this number of states that you, that 
that the gravitational code achieves over the R random user code. Now, the theory of non asymmetric codes deserves further study from a quantum information standpoint, and the fact that this improvement was possible to bring down this power so far may mean that they have the potential to be useful tools in what's called the NIST era of small quantum devices. Let me stop there. I have a question. If you were to think of your GT gravity model, your initial point is arising from a dimensional reduction of an extreme or four dimensional, say, Tyson Oxford black hole. Mm -hmm. What would happen in your estimates if I take this near extremality parameter to zero? Do you know? Or where, do, where does it actually enter in your estimates? Um, or in the story? You know? What is the near extremality parameter? Can you remind me? In, in the two dimensional JT description, what parameter controls this? Well, um, well, at the classical level, it would be you, the, the solution to the equation of motion given by, um, well, either by, you could say that it's either the temperature of, of, of the, of the two-dimensional black hole, or it's the coefficient of the linearly growing the telephone. Ah, gamma, the, this, uh, this gamma, gamma branch, yeah. That, that uh -huh. was gamma? Uh, no, no, sorry. So this, this gamma that, I, that appeared in, in my formulas was not gamma. The, the JT gamma yeah. in this discussion has been set to one. Uh, it has been set to one. It has been set to one. If if so, you put that back in, let me just right. Yeah. What what would happen? Do you know? Um, let's see. So the the parametric results would not change. Um, no. And this is yeah. I I think these results would be unchanged because we're working in a micro. So this parameter gamma will basically tell you how to measure the energy in JT gravity. So it'll, it'll give you some units for energy, right? It, you can see that because gamma, so you can see that I set gamma to one because in this cinch, there's no gamma that appears, right? In the cinch, if I put back gamma, there's a gamma that sits out front, and there's a gamma that sits under the square root next to the energy. So this is really two gamma eight in the JT language. So I, I've set gamma to one, but if I incorporate gamma again, I can still go to the microcanonical ensemble, and I'm just measuring energy in a slightly different way. But it's worth mentioning, I think, that if it would happen to this is a non-supersymmetric black hole, if it happened to be a supersymmetric black hole, that role would be qualitatively different. And mm -hmm. the specifically the limit you're talking about would be qualitatively different than if you did it in this model. Because uh, there's a gap. Oh, uh, good. And so here, you yeah. have a gap. Good, good, good. Yeah, here, here what's being assumed is, well, I suspect that all the results that I've told you about today will hold even for those models as long as you're past the gap. Below, the, in the really zero energy sector, it, it's unclear. That is a scary place. But I think that was where he was heading. Uh, you're asking there about the zero, the zero energy. energy. Oh, okay. Maybe related to the fact, I'm not sure why, why, uh, why the details of the model are important. Is that is related to the, the, the details are not. Yeah, so okay. this, I expect this to hold for any dilemma on gravity theory that has these features. No, I don't even see why dilemma on gravity is important. Maybe there's a ah, step. Okay, yeah, dilemma on gravity, well, roughly speaking, is important <laughs> for the reduction that I described very quickly on this slide. So there's a microcanonical ensemble that is chosen, uh, and particularly there are these brain coefficients, these CNs and CNCs, right? So the, CN, the C labels the brain flicker. That will happen in any dilaton gravity theory. But the, the fact that this N is labels an energy eigenstate of the boundary Hamiltonian, I'm not sure if it exists in an arbitrary dilaton gravity theory. What, what one really needs, to, sorry, to one, what, what one really needs is that upon a Cauchy slice, there exists a basis in which the asymptotic energy of the two boundaries are fixed and equal. So that, that fact, I'm only aware of in dilaton gravity. Uh, it, it's, it's not true, for example, in any sport. So in, in higher dimensional systems, you can have wormholes that connect two asymptotic regions with different energies. In, in JT, you cannot. And in dilaton gravity, more generally, you can. But, but for the broad theme that you're saying, there's a kinematic way to look at this, which is, in fact, worked up by Georgie uh, Chakravarty, which is before the, the uh, uh, year before the spending dinner at Osbeck. And the kinematic way is actually just the following. Uh, you know, let's say you, you have a big Hilbert space, it's a description of CPN in that particular space. You can ask how many, I mean, this is what I was saying in the beginning, how many, how many pairwise or orthogonal vectors can you find? So the kinematic question is you take every vector and you cut out a disk of radius 1 minus epsilon about every vector. 
So if anything which has inner product more than uh, epsilon is within that disk. And you ask how many such disks can fit? In low dimensions, of course, very small number of disks. You take this like two sphere, you ask how many disks of radius one minus epsilon and one is probably the two. Uh, but in high dimensions, that number is large. In fact, I think it's exactly the estimate you had to see c to the minus uh, s into 1 minus uh, uh, it's e to the minus <coughs> epsilon. I forget what the coefficients are, but I think mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's. You mean this, this part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So it's, uh, and uh, that's just a kind of magic question. And I mean, so that was very useful for how you can understand the fact of whole parallel, which is can maybe been reformulated now in terms of these non isometric codes. But that doesn't, I mean, that's just true, I think, regardless of the dynamics. It's ah, the yeah. way the volume of high dimensional yeah, yeah, yeah. space so this, in, in this story, the dynamics is entering in some sense in the ensemble that appears. So it's entering in the fact that these brain coefficients are independently and identically distributed in Gaussian random variables. If you change the dynamics of the theory, for example, if you have interacting brains in the interior, this code will change. And then it's not clear that a theorem like this will be true. I mean, isn't it true kinematically? Just if, let's say you take the hard measure of the big space. Let's just take the hard measure. Yeah. And you ask, you know, how many states can I, how many states S can I encode so that the are better as Yeah, that, that should be true, right? It's a, isn't it a kind of I'm not sure what you mean. If, if, this, this theorem is yeah. only possible because of the particular ensemble that appears. If, if it was a different ensemble, this theorem may not hold. So, it, it, sorry, yeah. So that, I mean, this is about the encoding and the encoding yes, preserving the, in a product. Yes. What you are talking about is approximate the orthogonal states in a given inverse. Same thing. I'll take my s to be my approximate set of vectors and then I'll write I, I don't know. That set is much bigger. He commented on that. Yeah. Right? The, what, what you're describing, I think, correct me if this is wrong, is just in some Hilbert space, some abstract Hilbert space, how many vectors can I find right. which are pairwise orthogonal? But there's no guarantee that a real gravitational dictionary will take a set of orthogonal semi classical states and map to precisely that set. What's happening here is it's not. But I could do that, right? I could write, I could define my map could, and take this and this map. I mean, but this, we don't know the details of the map. Yeah, we, we don't know the details of the map, it's not that clear at all, or yes. that there's anything gravitational about it. The advantage of this formalism is that there is something really gravitational about the code that's being written. Okay, let's have some coffee, and then we'll pick up at 11.